Um, our next speaker is Dr. Krishnan Ganapathy, so if we can ask him to get ready. He has uh, enjoyed a long, distinguished career as a, uh, not only a neurosurgeon, uh, but also one of the uh, founding members of uh, t telemedicine in, in, in India, a country that is very likely in need of such a solution. He's the director of Apollo Telemedicine Networking and an emeritus uh, professor at Talamandu uh, Medical University. So he's going to give us a talk about a very interesting topic, uh, the world in 2030, so he can see in the future. So if you want to know what your life will look like, let's listen to him. Uh, good morning, everybody. At the outset, I want to thank Dr. Shabir and Dr. Jack for having me over. In the last 48 hours, I've been able to do a lot of unlearning and relearning, which I think is more vital. When I am probably the senior citizen and my white hair makes me probably the oldest in this room at the moment, I vaguely recollect a photograph of that set on the top right. And I am absolutely confident that in my lifetime, I am going to see India like Taiwan. When I looked out of my hotel room, I see everywhere from 101, I don't see a single building less than 30, 40, 50 stories. And I am sure that India is also going to be like that. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to put you on a time machine and take you with me on a journey, a journey which all the younger people here are certainly going to see. We are already talking of 5G, we are talking of Chindia, China and India together, and the CIA in a report has said that by 2030, India is going to be a superpower. I'm just using India for illustration, this could apply to any other country as well. There is going to be a paradigm shift in the next two 15 years. When I was a medical student as a postgraduate and as a neurosurgeon, I taught my students on chasing diseases. That's what we were taught. I was taught to analyze the symptoms and signs, to make a diagnosis and to suggest treatment. It was a symptom-based diagnosis and most doctors in the 20th century would primarily and go after symptoms. But in the next 10 to 15 years, we are going to talk of predictive medicine, we are going to talk of preventive medicine, monitoring and prevention, and treatment, 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 you are going to have a lot of selection. I would like to call it the four P's. Science is making it possible. The previous speaker beautifully showed how we could even maybe diagnose a Down syndrome intrauterine. Medicine is going to be personalized, and I'm absolutely sure that an antibiotic which I prescribe is going to be customized and made by the pharmacist to suit the particular genome of the patient. In India, we have at least 50 hospitals today where a genetic profile can be done at, a, at not too much of a cost. It costs less than $300 and 95% of genetic diseases can today be analyzed with a few drops of blood. So this is going to be the future. Participatory medicine. In the 20th century, we were all told, doctor knows best. I would tell a patient, look, you've got a brain tumor, I'm posting you for surgery day after tomorrow. And that's it, no questions asked. But in the, already this is happening, Professor Facebook and Dr. Google are making it very difficult for me to practice. And when a patient comes to me, believe me, he knows almost as much as I know about his particular condition. So we call this participatory medicine. Technology trends. Towards prediction, I've already mentioned this, convergence test, productivity driven. Unfortunately, cost is going to be a major factor, not only in the developed Western world, but also in emerging economies in Asia. The fact will remain that a, a, a drug eluting stunt, stent may perhaps be preferred to an, another stunt based on cost. Insurance is going to be the major part. India has just launched on a massive universal health coverage where 500 million people are going to be covered up to $7,000 a year. So cost, unfortunately, will have to be factored in. Information driven, integrated. The previous speaker also very nicely mentioned that the younger generation is going to be different from what you said, sir. And they want to know what is going to happen. And I also tend to agree that in the future, I predict that the patient will be as empowered with information as you and I are, and therefore he wants to know about the uncertainty of medicine. Again, when I was a student and a doctor, I was, it was an, a regular pyramid chain. We have about 38,000 primary health centers, then we have a district hospital, a medical college, national institutes, and so on. But the trend is changing completely. 
we now talk about a primary teleradiology and telepathology. Very soon, the days will be gone when a pathologist will have to physically be present in a district hospital. I foresee that we will have a huge building where pathologists from the entire state, at least every state will have a center for pathology and every single slide from the 2000 hospitals in that particular state will be sent through the internet and with the assistance of artificial intelligence maybe these pathologists will go. I got a beautiful WhatsApp message a few days ago which said the patient will see you now. I think that is what is going to happen. Instead of you waiting for the doctor, the doctor will virtually come on your screen. This is already happening and it's only a question of time before M Health is fully integrated into the healthcare delivery system. I think this complex slide summarizes it very well. Even from before you are born and even after you die, a few weeks ago, at the All India Institute of Medical Science, a young woman wanted the sperms from her brain dead husband, a young husband to be removed so that she could have an IVF later. This had no precedent at all. She went to court and even the courts did not know whether this could be authorized or not. So this is what is happening and this is going to be the future. So you can see here, the doctor is only going to be a small part of the entire healthcare system. In fact, I'll be thankful if I'm somewhere in the decision-making system. You people have literally taken over the healthcare industry and people like me, I belong to the BC era, before computers and before Christ were one and the same. I'm the last neurosurgeon in India who was trained before even the CT scan came. Today, the healthcare industry is taken over by geeks, by technical experts, by healthcare economists, and old-fashioned clinicians like me are literally an endangered species. So we talk of next-gen drug database, we talk of national electronic record, we talk of remote monitoring, and you name it and all this. At the moment, these are available only in a few centers. I'm again using India as an example. This is available in maybe about 10 or 20 quaternary care hospitals, but we foresee that this will be the standard line of treatment over the next 10 to 15 years. I think technology is letting me down. Oh, thank you. You want to close my talk? <laughs> Can I please have the next slide? I remember what Lars Lexel said when he invented the gamma knife. He said, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I think that's a classical example here. Sorry, sir, the slide is advancing. It's not advanced. Maybe you can advance it. Okay, fine. Now, another important aspect over medicine in the next 10 to 15 years is going to be the continuum of care. The right word would be connected health. I think we will be able to have records from the time you are intrauterine till the time you're going to breathe your last, all at the touch of a button, right from your histology slides, everything is going to be there. And I love this American phrase, DIY, do it yourself. I started my medical career by testing urine, by boiling urine in, 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 over a Bunsen burner and, and smelling the urine. My assistant professor taught me to smell the urine and he said, Can you, can't you diagnose acetonuria? This patient has diabetes, look at the fruity smell. From that stage, we have now gone to a stage where I foresee that this is going to happen. Even your ultrasound examination with, with do-it-yourself kits, you will probably be able to do it. And a smartphone will even give you a differential diagnosis. Ouch. I'm going backwards. Okay, fine. Again, diagnosis and treatment is going to be the last part. I work at the Apollo Hospital Group, a for-profit corporate chain, the largest chain in Asia. Even a dividend declaring company has realized that there is more ROI, return on investment. There is more money in keeping somebody healthy the E way. And this is what is going to happen. The entire emphasis of health care is not going to be diagnosis and treatment, but to keep you healthy. In an absolutely ideal situation, medicine should not be there at all. There shouldn't be any disease at all. So this is going to be the emphasis and obviously we'll be using digital technology all the time. So this again, this slide says it all. We are talking of innovations, 
which keep up with emerging health and technology trends, solutions that span home visits, hospital visits, and so on. I don't know why the slides are. Am I going too fast? Or? Okay. Now, this is a slide which I think says it all. I started my medical career like this. For everything, we went to a hospital. A cough and a cold, we went to a hospital. Over the next two decades, it became like this. Several things were done at home. And in the next 10 years, this is cyber care is going to totally change everything. And I'm absolutely sure that hospitals will only be for cardiac transplant, renal transplants, bone marrow transplants, polytrauma, and so on and so forth. Even myocardial infarction, COPD, etc., etc., diabetes, hypertension, you name it, dengue, infectious fever, whatever it is, will be treated at home with the supervision of somebody located elsewhere. So this is going to be a radical change in health care. Just, uh, I can't help spend a minute about the massive universal health coverage which is going to take place in India, the largest ever attempted on this planet. Technology will bridge the gap, state-of-the-art information communication technology and even artificial intelligence. Again, we are now, we have already started talking of the digital patient. Uh, can you help me with the slide? It's not moving. Okay, now for any progress in healthcare, you require the entire support of the government. Without government support, it's just not going to happen. I think my projector is getting into fits. Oh, here is it. Okay, okay. Okay, fine. Now here again, you can see adoption, affordability, availability. And standardization. In a big country like India, for example, in any country in the world for that matter, you need to standardize everything. That's absolutely important. Now, ICT, the third pillar of the healthcare industry, and even things like games, gamification, is going to play a major part. Uh, I don't know. Do you have another uh, screen? Or? Okay, this Venn diagram again shows the intersection of genomics, the internet, physical behavior, and so on. Uh, sorry about this. We become so dependent on technology. OK, I think we'll skip all that. Now again, we are very happy to be closely associating with both Microsoft and Google. And the enormous database which we have in our hospital work has already started on this. And we will be applying this very soon. So biometric monitoring of user vitals. Doctors, clinical diagnostics, uh, again the previous speaker mentioned on diagnostic image interpretation as a low-hanging fruit. Artificial intelligence and radiology, you are aware of this, so I am skipping this. And I am very happy that we brought out an article along with uh, Shabir, with the, uh, with, the tele with the TMU. And of course, Google is training machines to predict when a patient will die. So this is the way the world is happening. And mirror, Dr. Mirror, this is, I understand, this is just coming into practice. It's not yet uh, commercially available, but it's just a question of time. Intelligent toilets are already available in Japan. I don't know if it's available in Taiwan. But just imagine a picture where you go empty your bladder, and within one and a half minutes, you get a beep, beep, beep on your smartphone, and your healthcare provider says, hey, look, there was microscopic hematuria. There were a couple of RBCs in the urine which you pass now. You are 68 years old. You better come immediately for an ultrasound scan or an MRI scan, get your PSA, and so on and so forth. This, do you want healthcare like this? I don't know. But this is what is going to happen. And again, you can see your blood pressure, heart rate, everything, so monitored on intelligent beds. When I was a medical student, and even much, much later, I was taught that the temporal lobe is the one which is responsible for the auditory cortex, and you see with your occipital lobe. I'm not sure whether my grandchildren will be taught the same thing. Today, you are already in a position to see with sound. You will be able to see with sound. Who knows, in the next 100 years, the human brain itself will get reorganized. And you may not be able to distinguish between seeing and hearing because ultimately, the interpretation of the brain on these images is going to be the same. Augmented reality for the total blind. Again, I remember when long, long ago, 
we used to, you know, we were talking of the Messiah. We were talking of, in the scriptures you see people who make the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. I mean, this was all done by a preacher when he preaches on the road. In the next few years, the blind will be able to see, the lame will be able to walk, the deaf will be able to hear, not necessarily with surgical methods, but methods like this, augmented reality and so on, bionic vision for the blind, retinal implants, the deep brain stimulation which is fairly routine today will be converted. In fact, uh, Viagra, the equivalent of Viagra is already available. We have a nucleus in the brain called the nucleus accumbens septi. And you can put an electrode there and that will serve the functions of Viagra. So this is the world we are going to be in. I am absolutely sure that 20 years from now, there will never be a stethoscope. The stethoscope with the two ear pieces will be found in a museum. And my grandchildren will say, hey, look, grandpa used this. Look at this cute, look at this odd machine which he used. Because you are going to have Bluetooth enabled, Zigbee enabled, etc. Small little device which already is available. And you are not going to listen to the second heart sound and the third heart sound. You are going to see an echo the equivalent of an echo and you will know the function, you will know the ejection faction, you will know the, the physiology of the mitral valve, the aortic valve, etc. So stethoscopes as we know are not going to happen. Imagine wearing a wristband and I am not, I am technologically challenged so I really may not understand too much of this but I understand that this is what is happening today. It's possible to get a drop of capillary blood and with a chip actually analyze. It's like a Fitbit with a biosensor that can count particles that includes blood cells, bacteria and so on. No doubt it will take quite some time. Now again, I think this is a classical example of technology going in search of an application. I dread the day when a neurosurgeon or a doctor decides to make a diagnosis of brain injury with a drop of blood. I personally am very uncomfortable, but they say that today you, the blood-brain barrier is broken when there's a neuronal injury and you can evaluate a biomarker called interleukin 10 with a drop of blood and this will tell you that the uh, neurons are injured. Of course, my answer, my question would be, so what? I mean, what if the neurons are injured? How does it alter the line of management? I strongly and firmly believe and I was very happy that the previous speaker from MIT mentioned that, emphasized that, that at the end of the day, it's the patient, the patient, the patient whom you treat. Do not go in search of an application because you have a technology. Ultrasound on a smartphone, high grade urine analysis. Two years ago, a paper was presented at the American Association of Neurosurgeons on diagnosing cerebral arteriovenous malformations by a urine examination. Imagine when I appeared for my neurosurgery exam, if I told my examiner, he asked me what investigation will you do, and I told him urine examination to diagnose a brain tumor, you know what would have happened, the consequences. But this is going to be a possibility in the next 10 years from now. Again, a couple of weeks ago, India carried out the first in vitro fertilization, a young lady, her mother had uh, CA breast, grandmother had CA breast, genetically proved with genomic analysis, BRAC1 gene was carried and when she got pregnant, the uh, fetal medicine specialist, we now had departments of fetal medicine, removed the oncogene from her egg and she was, and the baby whom she delivered, it has been proved that the breast indu cancer inducing gene has been successfully removed. So this is not science fiction. So this is going to be fairly common in the years to come. Next time you want to murder somebody, don't be so crude as to take a gun and shoot him. All you need to do is, maybe it's inappropriate here, yeah, the word hackathon, hack is used with, as a different concept. But a former vice president of the United States who had a pacemaker, the, an attempt was made to murder him by resetting the, the pulse rate from 70 per minute to zero per minute. Luckily, it was identified in time. And after that, the FDA today have issued orders. More than 20,000 pacemakers had to be recalled because they were not secure enough to prevent an outsider from emptying this. So this is the world we are going to live in. 
POCD, point of care diagnostics. I am delighted with this. I use this personally for the last two and a half years. We run three telemedicine units in the Himalayas at a height of 15,000 feet. We have used more than 4,000 samples. We have estimated with just a drop of blood, I can do liver function tests, renal function tests, cardiac enzymes and so on. This is going to become more and more sophisticated and I predict that laboratories as we know them today will actually become obsolete in about 10 to 15 years or even earlier. Just an example or two of AI and how AI can be used. My shirt size is 44. I go and today most of us use digital currency. I use a credit card to buy whatever I want. Big brother is watching me all the time. So next time I go to a shop and buy a 46 inch shirt, a message already goes and big brother has realized that I have put on weight. Or if I buy a little more alcohol than I normally buy, again big brother is watching me and he thinks I have depression. The slide is self-explanatory. Frequent purchases of candy bars by a diabetic. The information immediately goes to the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider contacts me and says, hey, look, avoid that Baskin Robbins. Don't take an ice cream. Your cholesterol is too high. Even when I'm thinking of stopping my car at a McDonald's to buy a McDonald's, I get a beep, beep, beep message which says, this is not good for you. Go somewhere else. The technology is already available. And why do you think people do all this? Not because they're interested in my health. Purely from an ROI point of view, the insurance company does not want to reimburse an bypass surgery due to coronary atherosclerosis. They would, like me, they would like to prevent that and this is what is going to happen. I never thought, I held a conference last year in December 2017 on drones and how to use drones in healthcare. I never thought within nine months this would become a practicality and on December, the government of India has now made clear the rules and regulations. Well, if everything goes right in another uh, two months from now, the Apollo Hospitals Madras will be using the first drone for delivery of certain material within the city. Again, as I told you, I belong to the 20th century. And for everything, there is a hype. It takes time before we settle down. But I think we have got to accept the fact the radical transformation of healthcare is technology dependent and I am worried that technology, technology, technology should not replace the tender loving care which all of us have been taught. Are you ready for a hospital which has no patients? I am ready. Here you see in London a huge hospital has been broken down and I predict that hospitals of the future will be very small hospitals, ultra-specialized hospitals, exclusively for transplants or polytrauma and things like that. So finally, we, we, this, would be, this would summarize everything. We are talking of pharmaceutical solutions, molecular analysis, BBB. We talk of bites, biology, and this is what is important. By 2030, it is predicted that we will have the first e-health lawsuit because a computer killed a patient in the absence of a doctor. So who is going to bear the responsibility? You, the programmers, or the owner of the computer? This is going to be an interesting medico-legal affair. The All India Institute of Medical Science, the Apollo Hospitals and so on, will be replaced by IBM, Microsoft, Apple, etc. So in conclusion, what is my take-home message? My take-home message is, I'm becoming a little philosophical. The good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Medicine, I'm delighted that MIT, um, advanced technologists mention the word uncertainty. I'm absolutely thrilled. Medicine continues to be a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. Listen, listen, listen. To the patient, he's telling you the diagnosis. Listen to him, find out what he wants. One wonders how Sir William Osler would have reacted to the introduction of artificial intelligence in healthcare. Born as Homo sapiens, trained in the BC era, it has been my privilege to see Homo digiticus involved. Marty Cooper, whom I met at an American Telemedicine Association meeting, uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, I spent a few minutes discussing with him how he invented the mobile phone, would never have thought. Charles Darwin said that it takes thousands of years for a new species to evolve. 
but in less than half a century a new species has evolved i call that species homo digiticus six out of seven billion people on this planet have transformed into that particular species to me chips were something i ate discs were part of the spinal column to all of you they have a totally different meaning and when i said semiconductor i was looking at an orchestra but to you it has a totally different meaning so this is the world and i dread the day when in the theater nurse get on to the internet go to surgery.com scroll down and click on the are you totally lost icon will this happen will i hope this only remains a cartoon and doesn't really change can you just switch on that put on that this is my last slide that one also i want the audio <laughs> told baby would become addicted and dependent on a smartphone today the differential diagnosis of a baby crying is not hunger is not passing wetting the uh, passing urine is not mosquitoes biting etc etc it is surely the fact that it is a mobile phone has been removed when this is the world we are living in imagine what is going to happen 10 years from now so whether you like it or not remote healthcare has come here to stay thank you once again for inviting me if there is time and there are any questions i would be happy to take them hi th hi this is yuan from uh, nyu um, thanks doctor for giving us such a optimistic and also very inspiring talk. Uh, so my question is about potential uh, concern, consideration in terms of social justice and this increasing digital divide between rich and poor. And uh, we're experiencing such a drastic, unevenly uh, technology diffusion over the population. So in term, and then when we are having the uh, healthcare services becoming more and more product driven, um, what kind of new responsibility or new considerations you are, uh, you know, that the developers or people working on data science or technology should be considered and be aware of? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Actually, I, it's the other way about. I, I'm giving India as an example. Today we have 1.1 billion mobile phones in the country. The mobile phone has leveled the playing field. Gone is the disparity between the rich, the super rich, and the below poverty line. It's sad, but there are more mobile phones than toilets in India. This is a fact of life. So I think technology, contrary to a general perception, bridging the camp, costs have come down, and the availability of information to the poorest of the poor has actually driven them as a motivating factor. So I am not worried that technology will be the prerogative of the rich and the super rich. On the contrary, it levels a playing field, one. My request, and I tell this wherever I go, and I am worried about it. I see all fantastic young boys and girls here, superb. I mean, your intelligence is amazing, etc., etc. But please, 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 Get a clinician. I know it's very easy to say. I know it's extremely difficult. But you m need the end user in whatever product you develop. Uh, I happen to be on the committee for the Government of India to evaluate research proposals. And in India, I see 
lots and lots of proposals of i'll give you an example there was one team which submitted a proposal for a dial mobile dialysis unit in a briefcase the idea was fantastic they had done the physics they had done everything everything but they did not even have a nephrologist on board their team now it's not that simple to get ethics committee institutional review carry it out and there are so many things so my request is that whenever you are entering the area of healthcare you must get the end user you must get the actual doctor who is going to apply this the success of your app is only measured by i measure the success of your app by the number of people who use it not forced to use it but who genuinely use it Thank you so much. Can we give him one give him a hand again?